Um, thank you for joining us. We're very excited to be launching Numair's book, Babu Bangladesh. Um, and it's an honor to have this, this launch, this memorial, this celebration of, of everything that Numair was. Um, he was a dear friend to me and a lot of people in this room. We're very lucky to have his mom here with us today, and we have his cousin and, and his great friends, and also um, IUB has been very kind to sponsor this event, and we have some of his students here who I think uh, also love him deeply. So. This is a very a heart-wrenching session because it's a celebration of literature, but at the same time also, you know, with so much emotion that we're all feeling to be here for a launch of an amazing writer who put his heart and soul into his words. And, and he unfortunately can't be here to be receiving all this love from all his fans and friends and family. But I'm sure he's, maybe he's watching it from somewhere above us. So I'd like to call the panelists today. We've got Nadeem Zaman, Saad Hussain, Rahul Soni, Kanishka Gupta, and Andalip Choudhury. Um, so Nadeem is a writer. He's got two books available here today, and um, he's also a childhood friend of Numer's. Saad, also a writer with a new book out this year. Um, Saad and me and um, Sal and Numer were in a writing group, and we would meet every Saturday and go over our books. And so we have a very, um, a very deep connection with this novel, which has turned out so beautifully in the end. Um, we have Rahul Soni, who is um, Numer's publisher. And I'm excited to hear the story about how this came about. We have Kanishka Gupta, who is Numer's agent and dear friend and did so much running around to make sure this book looks and feels and is as amazing as it is. And we have Andalib Choudhury, who is a fellow lecturer at IUB um, in the literature section um, department, where Numer was also a um, lecturing assistant professor. All right, with further ado, I'd like to invite Kanishka to say a few words. Enjoy. As all of you are fully aware that the author of this wildly ambitious and inventive book under discussion, Dr. Numer Atif Chaudhary, is no longer amongst us. I'm going to read out a piece um, which tries to capture the essence of Babu Bangladesh, Numer Chaudhary, the author, my close relationship with him, and the very fraught uh, publishing journey of the novel. This is my first visit to a literary festival outside India. Going just by cold, hard statistics, I ought to have been to Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad, or even Gaul before Dhaka. But then Numair Chaudhary happened. Babu Bangladesh happened. Let us talk about the more important and worthy firsts. Numair Chaudhary is the first Bangladeshi writer to be nominated for the Shakti Bhatt First Book Prize in its fairly illustrious 13-year history. <laughs> While it's no booker, to my mind, it is one of the most competitive, keenly contested prizes in the subcontinent, since it is open to writers of all genres and nationalities published within India. For the first time in the history of literary prizes in India, a posthumously published novel has been nominated for a prize. <laughs> Numer was first introduced to me by his childhood friend, fellow writer, and in his last few years, literary soulmate, Nadeem Zaman, in November 2017. From our very first conversation, it was clear that Numer was deeply suspicious of editors and agents. It was also clear that he was aware that he had written 
an ambitious and enduring book. He was in no hurry to publish it. He was a perfectionist who was never really satisfied with anything that he wrote. After sending him a barrage of Facebook reminders, I managed to wrangle the full manuscript of Babu Bangladesh out of him. I'm reading out his excuse for the very long delay. And he has been working on the novel for more than 15 years. This delay is a result of the fact that I have not expended any efforts in presenting the novel to anyone in years. I have simply focused on writing the thing. Babu Bangladesh could have been the political savior his country needed, or yet another charlatan, but he disappeared under mysterious circumstances before it could be deciphered which. In 2028, a biographer in his motherland begins to chart Babu's life from Operation Searchlight at nearby Dhaka University, announcing the bloody birth of a nation that went into the creation of Babu, through his formative years spent in the shadow of Shangshat Bhavan that acquires a life of its own, to nature fighting back against the onset of the effects of climate change in the Sundarbans and Bay of Bengal. Fact, fiction, and fantasy become one as Babu's life mirrors that of Bangladesh, leaving the biographer with more questions than answers. My editor and I were immediately struck by the novel's ambition scope and inventiveness, the irresistible, hypnotic, and I must be honest, sometimes overwhelming blend of myth and reality. Numeric experiments with various forms, magic realism, epistolary, and exposition to retell the history of a volatile and troubled nation through the biography of a fictional political luminary, Babu Abdul Majamdar. I don't know though about those who are familiar with Bangladesh's history, but for readers back home, including myself, the novel is a literary maze wherein it is hard to distinguish between truth and half-truths, truth and fabrications, and half-truths and fabrications. Numer employs clever, extremely witty, and sometimes hysterical wordplay in almost every second line, making Babu Bangladesh a biting and audacious satire on Bangladesh even as it is one of the few works of magic realism from the country in the English language. His ingenuity and wit are evident in the way he conjures, conjures up fictional political parties, NGOs, entrepreneurial bodies, corrupt journalists, international terrorists, dogmatic mullahs, and of course, those all pervasive footnotes. The novel has come under some Criticism for its occasional detours and digressions into textbook-like descriptions. But that is exactly how Numer wanted it to be. In his very, very first email to me, Numer wrote thus, in essence, via the presentation of a larger-than-life Babu, the biography disintegrates into a rumination of Bangladeshi history and by extension, the plight of newly emergent economies, hegemons, and the global tentacles and the evolution of sustainable markets and lifestyles. In my tragically short-lived association with Numer, the one good thing I managed to get him to do was to attend a major literary festival in Kerala in February 2018. Numer got the chance to meet writers, editors, and literary festival directors from different parts of the world, and he returned from the trip very inspired, rejuvenated, and energized. One of the people he met was the novelist and poet Bernice Shawley, director of the Georgetown Literary Festival, Malaysia's largest literary festival. Bernice invited Numer for the 2018 edition. Numer died two months before the festival was scheduled to take place. Numer returned to India in April 2018, which is when he met his eventual editor, Rahul Soni, from HarperCollins India. Numer took to him instantly and with the approval of his extremely supportive and brave mother, Lubna Chaudhary, Babu was vouchsafed to Rahul less than five days after his burial. HarperCollins and I have tried our best to remain faithful to Numer's text and vision, though there were times when I was reminded of some lines uttered by the perennially exasperated and overwhelmed unnamed biographer of Babu. And I'm quoting those. While those close to Babu claim that his spirit was singular, and have emblazoned him tirelessly. In my nine year quest, I have time and time again been burdened and left clutching at ash. 
As frustrating as it is to see the narrative threads ignite, the story must go on. One big concern I had was that I did not have in my possession the latest draft of Babu Bangladesh at the time of Numair's death. Thankfully, it was retrieved by his younger sister, Talita Chaudhary, from his laptop that he had carried on his ill-fated trip to Koyoto. Babu Bangladesh was published to critical, critical acclaim in India in June this year. Barring one or two negative ones, most reviews have showered effusive praise on Numair's ambition, imagination, and highly charged prose. While I'm still on the lookout for an international publishing deal for Babu, I'm hopeful that some experimental and adventurous indie UK-US publisher will take a leap of faith sooner than later, like his editor at HarperCollins did. But most importantly, like Numair did more than a decade ago when he started conceiving the Babu world during his PhD at University of Texas. In a heartfelt piece published by his younger sister, Talita Chaudhary, in a major online publication in India, she writes about the similarities between Babu and Numair. I quote, Numair and his protagonist, Babu Abdul Majamda, share little in common regarding their personal biographies, though both were bachelors who were born around the same time, had a parent who was an educator, and attended college in the US. While Babu spent time playing on the fields of the parliament building during his youth, Numair and I witnessed the silhouette of the same building as we drove past it each morning on our way to the elementary school year. We too were raised by a male nanny and an entrusted gardener who was so much but only known as Mali Bhai. They're the Mali Bhai in the snake section. The pair were almost animal lovers. Here ends the commonalities between Numair and his fictional protagonist. I would like to mention another major similarity between the author and his creation. Like Babu, Numair was very kind and deeply idealistic, a lover of a bountiful but greatly endangered nature of peace, equality, justice, emancipation of women, a lover of magic and folklore, the downtrodden, the marginalized, the terrorized, the near extent. Most importantly, like Babu, he was a people's person. When he and I were having conversations about potential publishers for Babu, Numair told me he wouldn't mind publishing with a small indie press that believed in the redistribution of wealth. I told him, forget redistribution of wealth, publishers seldom share royalty statements on time. In the last few months preceding his death, Numair was deeply disturbed about the political situation in Bangladesh, in particular the student protest that made headlines globally. In a message to me, he said, being careful with religious and political content, things are getting bad in Bangladesh. This book could be my life can, so if I'm going to go for it, it better be damn good. Sadly, this made his writing very self-conscious. In a subsequent message he wrote to me, in Bird, I'll be inserting four pages about a heroic and peaceful mission and direction taken by a so-and-so party, I'm not going to name it, Man, it's the perfect thing to do. If they still want to kill me because of the preceding criticism, well, this is the least and the most I can do to protect myself now. Another dilemma that Numair faced was of the constant need to update the story, especially since the novel is narrated from a time in the distant future. In one of the messages he told me, put together quickly, Rohingya crisis, Yaba smuggling via Cox Bazaar, NGO corruption, Islamic extremism, and Rohingya prostitution already happening will be a huge deal in the next few years, completely missing from the book, put together in two paragraphs and inserted in Ireland. I'm going to end by reciting a poem that Numair wrote. Yes, he was a poet too. His poetry will appear in his next book, which is a short story collection. Harper is publishing it on the death of a friend's daughter in a terror attack. No, none of this is contained. In a dome, you cannot be contained in shapes. And the paint is still fresh. The earth, air, water now know you by name. But you will never leave your space here where your feet had placed you right beside me. Thank you.
Hello, hello. So I'm going to start with Nadeem Zaman, uh, who introduced me to Numer. Uh, so Nadeem, Numer and you were uh, childhood friends, but you lost touch because you relocated to the US when you were young. Huh? Uh, it was in 2002 when you uh, chanced upon a short story of his in an anthology of South Asian writing at a Chicago bookstore. Uh, that you decided to reach out to him. So tell me, what was it about uh, th this story, Chokra, that made you, you know, reach out to a very old friend? Well, first of all, it made me completely self-conscious, like, oh my goodness, I'm not doing anything, I'm lazy. But you mentioned in the Dhaka Tribune memo, Apeet, that you were, yeah. you were also a little daunted because you yeah. hadn't published anything. <laughs> didn't, and he, and no. that anthology included authors like Salman Rushdie, oh, yeah. Jampal Hari. Yeah. Huh? So, as you said, it was about 2002, uh, Borders Bookstore, which is no longer around. I'm browsing and I come across this anthology and looking at all the, the, the table of contents, looking through the authors and I see Numer Chodhri and I go, okay. I go to the bio and it says his, it's, it's his bio. I go, there, there cannot be two people born the same year with the same name with the same history. If it is, then I don't know the other one. And, but this was before Facebook, so I didn't know how to get a hold of him. All the research I did showed up defunct emails, but what happened was I ended up reading that story, Chokra, which is one of the finest pieces of short fiction I've read um, in English in recent times. And then I found his other stories on this GeoCity side, uh, site and I read all of them. But it wasn't until 2012 that I actually went and found him on Facebook and I said, just want to make sure I, these stories that I'm reading, they're yours. And he said, my stories are out there. How did, how did they get out there? And that, that started the back and forth and me kind of pestering him till he showed me the first 100, 110 pages of Babu. Um. So at what point did he mention that he was writing Babu Bangladesh? Huh? He didn't name it. Um, I, again, I am a champion, if, if not at anything else, than at bugging people to death. I've done it to you, to the point of... You haven't read my book, huh? No, 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 about <laughs> bugging you with messages. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? I, I almost gave us both heart attacks doing that. So... I knew he was working on this novel, which he said was also part of his, his dissertation, which was in the works at the time. And so the first thing I said, I said, send me something. Pause, there was like no typing, nothing happening. I, I guess he was thinking. And then I kept on pestering, I pestered, and then he goes, okay, well maybe we can read each other's work. I said, send me yours first, you first. Um, and that's how I got those first 110 pages, which I read through the night at least a dozen times um, and then over the next week and he didn't have a title for it he didn't have a title he was i don't think he was settled entirely on babu bangladesh based on the one of the last conversations i had with him la a year ago la uh, from from from, from where was we are after now. he he was he got in touch with me yeah 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 this was one of the final times we hung out before i i left for the u.s and he said, uh, but the title, I'm still struggling. It's Babu Bangladesh. Um, he had something, he, he had a, a, um, the title of another poem. He had many. But then Babu Bangladesh ended up being the one. However, I think it's the one that lasted with him the longest and there was nothing else that came up that, was, that could compete with it. You told me in a private conversation that uh, Numer Radio initial feedback on the first 110 pages mm -hmm. of, a, of an earlier draft 50 times. Something like that, yeah, yeah. he told me. Yeah. Why did you do that and was he working in isolation? Was there any support system? I don't, that's not the sense I got. I read it and I wrote him uh, this long-winded feedback where I said, I think you've created something here that is, I wish I wrote it. <laughs> um, I told him it was, like Carlos the Jackal meets Forrest Gump meets, you know, Garcia Marquez meets, you know, Bangladesh. That's how, that's how foreign agents pitch the new authors. This famous book meets that. Yeah, but that's. And so I did that. And I said, 
if you're not going to do anything with this, I don't, I mean, I'll fight you, but I don't know what else to do beyond that. Then he wrote back and he said, I just read this all through the night, something along those lines. He goes, because I guess he was writing, he was so deep into it, he wasn't, he was just in his room doing it day and night. The only people reading it initially, I guess, were his uh, peers and uh, part of his cohort, his uh, professors, so forth. And I think he was not, some of what you covered in your conversations with him and his feelings overall, what to do with this once it's out in the world and if and how it's going to get out there in the world, he was not sure how to handle that. And I said, well, if you're writing this and this is what it is, it needs to go out in the world. So uh, you started out as a short story writer, right? Yeah. You wrote your novel after the short story collection. Yeah. So Numair has been writing a lot of short stories all this while he had been working on Babu Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And if one reads his short stories, it's impossible to believe that this is the same person who has created this novel because his short stories, while they, they have a lot of merit, they were very conventional, structurally, formally. And uh, Babu is, is, is full of charged, energetic prose. So I just wanted to know, uh, uh, did he ever tell you how he got the idea for Babu Bangladesh? Where did he get this idea for this four biography? You know, I think it was one of those where, as I see it, or, and maybe I'm projecting, and um, the, this idea of the great fill-in-the-blank country novel, you know, the great American novel, nobody knows what it is. Um, people still talk about it. It's something that people said to me when I, when I was in my 20s, and I said, I'm a writer. Oh, are you going to write the great American novel? I go, I, I don't know. Um, so, I get the sense that he, there was so much he wanted to say about Bangladesh, about where we belong, where we are, where we're going, where we are, um, moment to moment, what's happening. He, you, again, you captured it. He wanted to write this book right up into the last minute that he put the last period on it. On it. So, I get the sense that that was his canvas. That's what he was going for without giving it a name. He wasn't saying he's writing this great novel of Bangladesh. He's just writing what he feels. I believe what he felt he, if he wrote one book, that this book was going to be it. So uh, the two of you were quite the strange uh, bedfellows <laughs> while you're uh, Debut novel is an extremely realistic account of the 1971 war based on family history mm -hmm. and passed down stories. Babu is wildly imaginative, unclassifiable and experimental. How did you help each other out with your respective writing? I mean, did you give him critique like occasionally? No, I, I actually was not. I let him, I mean, when he, when he would do the work, you know, we would hang out two, three days in a row, and then, then for a week, I wouldn't hear from him, and I was, and I would just say, "Okay, you are somewhere where you need to be with your work. Go there." Um, but I wasn't seeing the pages as they were happening. Uh, but our conversations, which were many, and they went into late into nights, um, walking around in the neighborhood, um, at parties, <laughs> wherever we were somehow we found a way to come back to talking about writing. So essentially it was about how we wanted to see the world through writing, how we wanted to see, how we want to see Bangladesh through our writing specifically. It was also making him sick because I mean, yeah. it, it took a toll on him yes. and he wanted to pack everything mm -hmm. into, one, into this one book. Yes, he, he certainly did. And uh, one evening I went and he goes, I walk into his room and he's sitting on the bed and he goes, I haven't moved from the spot all day. I said, what, what have you done all night? He goes, I've been writing all night. I said, okay, so now you need to sleep all day, get some rest and then get right back to it. And then I think, I think balance was something that was missing. And I, I understand that because if he was going to work two, two weeks straight and he needed someone to actually bring him food and feed it to him, that's what he needed to do. So I was uh, 
retrieving all my Facebook messages with Numero over the last one, one and a half years. And it's full of me chasing him. Give me the draft, give me the draft, give me the draft. Smileys, addresses, you know, these angry smileys. But he, he was just taking his own sweet time. Okay, so also the two of you had certain issues with the Bangladeshi literary establishment. I don't know what the establishment is, but yeah. yeah. But could you tell us more about uh, them? I hope you don't have a book coming out next year around the same time. Huh? If I do, huh. it's ending right now. <laughs> no, I, I. It wasn't so much with specifically the literary establishment. In my case, I've been I've received huge support. You know, um, before in the time of the others reached you, um, my collection uh, reached was actually invited by. Uh, Anis Ahmed, then it went to Bengal Lights, then it was published. Uh, so that started the life of that book, which then has come out with its US release two days ago. What it was, I, we were, what we had issues with was basically the, the larger, the, the, the systemic larger framework in which we had to, he had to exist more than I do, because I live in the States. Um, numerous stakes of living here and working within um, the hierarchies um, uh, were, were a lot higher than mine. I didn't care who got mad at me or who doesn't like me here. I still don't. Um, and he didn't either. I'm not saying he, he was worried about that either, but our, our conversations would predicate the fact that he, he, still has, he still is going to live here and work here, and I'm not. I will forever be connected with and visit as long as I'm able to um, and write about Bangladesh and Dhaka. Uh, but, you know, if for some reason I'm ostracized or I'm not published, it'll be sad, but my stakes were not what his are. Uh, so that was more it. It's just this, you know, it, when, when, when trying, to, when trying to, to go against systems and systemic issues, it's the same everywhere. So in the last few years, I've noticed one trend, and this doesn't apply to Bangladeshi writers writing in English. It applies to Sri Lankan writers writing in English, Pakistani writers writing in English. They have these very fancy uh, creative writing degrees from the US, UK. Uh, they are very well connected. Most of them are living in the UK, US, but they, they are not able to get publishers. I mean, you teach English literature at uh, St. Mary's in Maryland. You have a PhD, yeah. And Numair has such excellent credentials, but I mean, look at Shalbari. Shalbari, for instance, Shalbari Zoraima, she's been living in the US for such a long time. She's been, she's written uh, like a screenplay for Quantico also, but I mean, none of them are getting acceptance in the UK or the US. So what do you feel about that? I mean. Well, my, my tiff uh, and my frustrations with the US publishing and agenting industry goes back um, to this, to this collection. It goes back at least a decade. I still don't have an agent in the US. Um, my first book was published th uh, with you, with Pan Macmillan India, uh, uh, the novel, and then the first, uh, the B B Days, and Days and Nights up in the main house was with Bengal Lights. So I'm proud to say that I was first published A, in the city of my birth, in the country of my birth, and then in, South, in, in Asia, in India. Um, so, MFA programs, you know, I don't, I, I didn't attend one. My, I had many professors that did. I have many colleagues that did, and it's a mixed bag. Um, but I do get the sense that part of something that happens in the U.S. MFA mill, it's it's a big party. It's a big who's who party, and so it'll class sizes are maybe this, you know, selective, and then you're studying probably with some U.S. literary big big name, um, and through them you make connections in the industry. But the larger thing, what you said about, you, you know, Sri Lanka and Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Indian authors still struggling, it's because the, the industry is still very myopic. Um, Monica Ali's session, session earlier in the morning talked about hyphenating. So if, if it's a white male author in the US, they'll just have a novel by a writer. Me, Saad, 
with all these other people. We presented, oh, Bangladeshi American author, American author, uh, Bangladeshi author of American, uh, American born, American raised Bangladeshi author. Like it'll be, the hyphenation will be longer than the novel itself. So before we get to that point, by the time we, we're there, agents are, I guess, like, I don't have the energy to read your book because I don't know how to box you. An Australian publisher loved Babu Bangladesh, but she said it was too long. So I don't think it's long. It's just 120,000 words. And she's saying it. She's in the wrong business. If it's she's too saying long it in a year when a 1,000 page novel has been shortlisted for the Booker Prize. Mm -hmm. it, didn't, it, it did not win. But I don't think Babu Bangladesh is long. I mean, like regularly. What do you, what do you think? I, huh? Yeah. So f for someone who was responsible for Babu being published, you've been quite ret reticent about the book and sharing and promoting the reviews. I mean, is there any reason why? I just forgot. No, I didn't forget. No, but I, no, no, I didn't. No, uh, many of his friends are, have not even read the book. Right. I, I, I think. I, I think one of my things was, hey, you were doing such a good job. Um, I kind of didn't want to wash over it. No, but we don't. Um, but no, I mean, there was zero reticence. It was, it was quite literally, I wanted to book the, the book to start to get a life of its own. You were being a great champion. Um, he, had, he had champions that were moving it along. Uh, so I was staying out of the way, but just, just for the sake of redundancy. So I'm not pushing the same things that are already being well pushed. Uh, but I mean, this is a book I'll, I'll keep promoting as long as I'm, I have a voice. Um, in context of that, actually, I'd like to say something. We're looking for the book. Um, the book is out on the market and it's sold out. You yep. go to pretty much any of the bookstores, to Bookworm, to any of the big bookstores that we have in the country, and you won't find the book. I have students in the audience right now from IUB, um, most of whom are sharing books because the book is, um, it's just basically sold out everywhere. And I think the support for it within our country, we recognize the new Salman Rushdie, even if the larger audience outside doesn't. And I feel like that, from that perspective, the more the book is promoted here, um, the more the book will be but, available. That people but, are reading. but the bookstores are not ordering in large quantities. You know, they're, they're ordering like 50 copies, 100 copies, and then they get sold out, and then they're chasing the publisher. And you know, it's not easy to, so I think, I think if you know any bookstore or not, if any bookstore owner there in the I crowd, a lot of people who are asking for the book, maybe that's unusual. Maybe that's kind of the point of the book. Um, we're not used to reading books like this. It's 400 pages, it's big, and it's layered, and it's, con and it's extremely, extremely dense. Um, but people are reading, people are trying it, because this is our voice. Um, you're from India, but this is our first real voice when it comes to magical realism. And he wrote this, and we'd like copies. Thank you. <laughs> so. Talking of magical realism, uh, Bangladeshis have an affinity to South American literature. Yeah, born of 100 years of solitude. The book is probably every established and new writer's favorite book. Uh, and South American literature has a long tradition of being translated into Bangla. However, Babu Bangladesh is one of the first original pieces of magic realism from Bangladesh. So. What kind of impact uh, can it have on the writing and literary community of a, on a writing and a literary community which has been brought up on a stable of a staple of magic realism from South America? Personally speaking, I know that when he wrote this book, he wrote it in the language that he's comfortable with. Um, if you speak, to, if you spoke to him, and um, if you interacted with him, um, his background was um, in the English field, so to speak, um, and he's one of the very few creative writing PhDs this country has. Um, under those circumstances, of course, he's been affected by this. But in terms of the reading public. The idea of magic realism, the idea of the fantasy world that he posits here, that he ties into um, something as unusual as the Bengali history, as you point out, it's never been done before. 
the fact that he has created this should be inspirational. It should shock people. I mean, I have a student um, from the literature department who's a creative writer who said, Miss, I don't think I can ever write this. And I pointed out he didn't write it. He, it took him 15 years to get to this level. And I think you'll see new writers coming up who are going to be inspired because they are reading this and saying, well, if he was 28 when this started, um, in five years, I'll give it a go. And, you know, maybe publish in less than 15 years, but it's a possibility. So I'll come to Saad when, because she's talking about new writing, which, which is inspiring the new generation of writers. So Saad is a rarity, not only in the Bangladeshi writing community, but South Asian writing community, because he writes uh, in a genre that no one reads, but more <laughs> importantly, a handful of writers excel at. He writes satire, science fiction, dark comedy. So, Saad, tell me, why don't we have too many outliers like you and now Numer, huh? Well, you know, I, th I think the, well, I'll, I'll talk about Numer first, because I think he, he had a level of technical skill and craftsmanship, which probably comes bec from writing consistently for many years. And we don't know all the bad things he's written, but th this is kind of the culmination of the of the of the the good uh, the kind of finished skill that he's showing here. Uh, the 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 issue with uh, science fiction and fantasy is uh, what what you were talking about uh, being published abroad. By Thor. Yeah. No less than Thor. Yeah. Well, because I write in science fiction and fantasy, so I I don't think it's necessarily that. Uh, Asian authors are discriminated against. I think it's what we write that's not interesting to uh, an American audience or a British audience. And that's something that, you know, you, you might have to just accept that that this is, you know, the, the kind of diaspora writing we, 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 we do. It's not necessarily interesting to other people uh, or that there's a lot of examples of it already. So in a way, you're, you're kind of repeating repeating the same stories over and over again. And, you know, maybe there's only room for, for a couple of those books. So, uh, Numer and you were a part of a writing group. Shazia, who made the introduction, yeah. she was also a part of it. So tell me about uh, the group and how you uh, critiqued well, you each know, other's we, works and whether, whether to... you had read uh, drafts of Babu and whether you had any feedback to give. Because when we had our conversation, you told me that some of the dig digressions are fascinating to you and some of them kind of bogged you down. Yeah, you know, we, we, we didn't, we only uh, kind of, he, he only joined us, uh, those four of us, he only joined us about the last year. He had already kind of finished, but he wasn't sure which order, uh, you know, of the sequence of... of, of he wasn't sure of the order, he yeah. just wanted to like keep tweaking it. Uh, he he, he yeah. could never, uh, yeah, he could never really finalize on anything. Uh, he was always willing to add stuff, <laughs> which, uh, uh, you know, we've already talked about. But uh, I think um, the, the I appreciated the, the skill he had in, in writing and definitely the kind of technical craftsmanship because it's, I think that's what's lacking in a, in a lot of writers right now um, is that that level of, 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 of uh, technical skill. But with the digressions, I mean, I honestly feel that, yeah, like the Shangshut Bhavan digressions, I mean, I really enjoyed those parts. But that's interesting that's to me. Everyone's favorite section, yeah, huh? Yeah, because of the geomancy and all, all of that. Yeah. And that, that's unusual, and you give a lot of information. Some of the other stuff, uh, because he keeps taking you in, in directions, and sometimes you're just like, I does. just, you know, I just want the story. Like, I just want Babu stories. At, at, at some point, I was uh, feeling that a little bit. But, uh, you know, that's what he wrote. So, I mean, you, you know, that's what he wanted to do. Uh, um. So talking about Sansad Bhavan, um, so uh, it's it's been a meeting point of not only political leaders, but also a wide cross section of society. Uh, and I don't think none of, no form of art has been as ambitious or comprehensive in its depiction as uh, Numer. Babu Bangladesh. So I wanted to ask uh, whether in rendering Sansad Bhavan with its own mythos, 
has Babu Bangladesh brought this cultural backdrop to a foreground for a new audience and through it provided a fresh introduction to the country? I mean, yeah, I would say so. I mean, has what what place space does Sansad Bhavan occupy in the cultural and the literary imagination of the country? I mean, has it has it been depicted in I think uh, there isn't a person. works works in English or even Bangla? No, no, I don't think we've had as much writing on the Sansad Bhavan because it's always just been there. A large part, portion of what he did in this book is to turn things we've all experienced. Things like going to, and I think I'll be speaking about this uh, from all of our perspectives, going to a place like a Kachi place, right? And Shutki, for example. Um, each of us have an idea of what that is. It's a part of our part of our mythos, part of who we are as Bengalis. Mache Bhate Bengali, and then he writes about the fish people. I mean, he's taken elements and stories and concepts, and it's not just uh, Shangshad Bhavan, though that is, of course, a big aspect. Um, he's taken elements that are so everyday and so uniquely us, um, and he's turned it into literature. Um, you can't imagine associating a Bengali with a piece of shutki, but when I read that section, that's true. That's exactly us. We're tough. We're dry. We're um, we survive anywhere, and we really <laughs> like spicy food. I mean, it's exactly who we are. So, thank you. The fact that he could do that. It's not just the Sangsad Bhavan, but that is where we all meet. That is our center point. Um, if you ask somebody who's grown up in Dhanmundi, um, your house is in location or in uh, the indication of your house is the direction from Shangshad Bhavan or the, it's four miles away from Shangshad Bhavan. So it has been a center point for our lives and our parents' lives. Well, I think that the other thing is that there isn't too much uh, writing in English, Absolutely. right? In, uh, from Bangladesh. So, we have a kind of opportunity to to introduce everything for for uh, to to the wider world uh, for the first time. So almost any topic you you pick, you're, it's going to be original uh, or, or in English at least. Is this the first work of magic realism in English from Bangladesh? Well, and what about uh, magic realism in uh, uh, Bangla? Humayun Ahmed. Humayun Ahmed is one of our top writers, and he has used magic realism in his writing. Um, it is, of course, done in, in Bengali, and there have been fewer translations than there should be. But he is one of the most popular writers, and his work contains magic realism. It's not an unusual concept for us. We have the Bengali literary scene, which promotes this concept. And if you think about a lot of the supernatural elements, a lot of the magic elements, the stories, we've all been brought up on ghost stories. Our parents used to frighten the hell out of us when we were all children and we'd share that. I mean, myth and myth making is a part of the Bengali ethos and that's what he's used here. I'm now going to come to Rahul Soni, Numer's uh, editor at HarperCollins. Uh, Rahul uh, is, has been with HarperCollins for two years but his association uh, uh, with literary books goes back to 2008 when he uh, founded this bilingual uh, literary journal Pratilipi. Uh, he's also been associated with an agency, uh, a literary magazine. Agency is that? This is mine. <laughs> a, a literary magazine, and he's closely involved with uh, Sangam House Residency, which is the most well-known uh, writing residency. So Rahul, I wanted to know uh, uh, what kind of uh, pitches, submissions, books have you seen from Bangladesh? It's a very short answer uh, to that. I haven't. Uh, this was the first uh, that came my way, uh, which is, I don't know, should it be surprising? I guess, uh, I mean, there's a lot of writing that happens. Uh, but I don't know, all my Fratilipi years, uh, uh, I haven't seen anything. Uh, I know that Harper has published, I know that Harper has published uh, Anisul uh, Haq in translation uh, about a year ago. Uh, but yeah, no, we don't see enough. Uh. So you, uh, I remember you wanted to publish Babu after reading the prologue. Yes. And uh, the book is divided into five sections and prologue is like the, the shorter section. And uh, normally literary editors wait for the full manuscript yeah. to come. So where did this conviction come from? 
and just just the quality of the writing itself uh you've been around writing uh, for so long you know uh, that you're reading something special and from the very first sentence it is clear that nomer is operating on completely different standards from most writing i actually do have a question for you as the editor um as somebody who reads so much writing how do you know that when somebody's writing isn't just self indulgent and is in fact literary i mean how do you make that justification or that choice it's uh i don't i don't know if there's a straight answer to that uh it, it, these things are so subjective and you have to go with your instincts uh in publishing as an editor that acquires books so what i bring to it is my sensibility that's what i'm supposed to be doing there and this is something that uh that worked for me on every level pretty much rahul you met numair just once in may 2018 mm -hmm. what were your impressions after meeting him of his writing process because i remember it was a one hour meeting and it was just numair talking and rahul and i like listening in rapt attention not quite not quite i mean we did get in a word every now and then uh but no uh, i think at that point you had already shared with me about 100 pages and uh and i i was blown away like uh nadim was uh, and what i remember telling him is that it reminded me of course of the boom generation of uh, latin american writers but with a very very modern contemporary voice um uh, just the scope and ambition of his work and in person i found him to be just this clearly intelligent and articulate person uh, very very passionate about his work uh which of course shows in that he's he was able to stick to it uh, for 15 years working and reworking it um so in an online interview on harper broadcast which is a internal like property mm -hmm. of harper collins you wrote this is a novel about everything and if it doesn't quite get all the way there it is still brilliantly it is still a brilliantly ambitious work a work of great boldness and imagination and quite stupendous for, for how far it actually manages to go so do you think you would have liked to work no mer on the draft a bit more and what more could he have done i i would have yes uh i mean i i think uh the sansad bhavan section is possibly the most completely realized of the five sections here uh my favorite is the tree okay. yeah <laughs> uh and uh what i would have liked to work on was maybe maybe on uh humanizing babu a little more uh seeing his story a little more i realize of course that his method was uh to utilize the method of non fiction yes. uh but yeah still i i think there are places where we could have uh maybe worked on to realize babu a little uh, more clearly uh this, also this there were sections that numair had clearly not finished uh there were large parts where he had just uh notes to himself in there um and again yeah sorry no i just wanted to mention one thing as you were mentioning about the shankshad bhavan section um my point was that you're absolutely right i feel that was the most polished but the other sections were more free in the way in which he was writing them and you can tell that he was jumping from idea to idea if that was how he wanted to present the book don't you feel that um that was the author's deliberate choice well uh i would like to have that conversation with him and uh yeah i i mean it's one of the regrets of my life that i could not work with him closely on this i think i would have learned a lot and we would have also worked on the book a little more you know i i i also feel that the the shankshu bhavan part was really polished and uh that kind of was the best uh finished and the 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 latter two parts i think maybe so numair numair left i mean had shared a sort of a document with us with the kind of edits he wanted to carry out and one of the things that i like 
thing that was very clear in that document was that he wanted Babu to be more of a flesh and blood character, you know, and he wanted to strengthen some of the characterizations. Well, though, that, that's kind of the, like, when you're reading this, you're kind of yearning for more of a linear Babu story because you don't get that, right? But, but he is the main character and you just want a, a, a kind of more of his story uh, and, and maybe slightly less of the digressions. I think maybe that's, uh, maybe that's what he intended to do anyway later on and never got a chance. Raul, how hard is it to uh, edit a book when the author is no longer there? I mean, I mean, uh, what sort of edits did you do? I, I, I did the bare minimum that I could because I didn't have no matter to give me the go ahead on those edits. So it had to be the closest to what he had left us. Um, I, yeah, like I said, there were bits that I would have liked to work with on him, but I couldn't be doing I that. I think the final draft uh, that we received from Talita, the younger sister, it, ha it, ha it had notes, right? It had uh, notes and his famous instructions to himself. Huh? Hmm. So uh, a part of uh, his editorial note has this list of words which have appeared more than once. And there are like 20, 25 generic names and he's giving instructions to himself. This has appeared 50 times. This has appeared 100 times. This has appeared 60 times. And he, you know, he was like looking to like replace that with a synonym. Um, he actually asked all of us for synonyms. Um, he did. Um, he would walk into a classroom, and I know his students are here, and again, um, they are the ones who short shared these stories with us. And in the middle of a lecture, he would suddenly stop and say, what is the other word for this? And my students, all of them, are very eager to please, um, so they start looking into the words. So I'll tell you that he had that list with him at the university. They were his students, and they were also his They were his researchers, assistants, absolutely. Researchers. We all were, we all were. Um, because he was working on it, no matter what else he was doing. Um, it was at the back of his mind. He was thinking about the book, um, polishing words and phrases and statements, and trying his absolute best. And he was such a perfectionist. I'm so glad you wrestled it away from him, because we wouldn't see it right now. Because he would not have thought it was over. He would work on it for another five years at least, and I'm glad you snatched it with all your smileys and emojis. <laughs> but it's also so rare to find someone who is not in a hurry to publish, is going to work Never on it until... Never in a hurry to publish. Huh? Never. I, I really respect that. Uh, so now let's talk about the legal edit. Uh, uh, so, like, just tell us the whole process. Hmm. Yeah, what do I say here? I mean, there wasn't really much of a legal edit. Uh, I had flagged a few sentences every now and then saying, okay, is this something that might be problematic? And uh, 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 his so, so colleague, we were Amish, like, you know, uh, no, this is on the Wikipedia page of that leader. This is on the I mean, Wikipedia page. All of page it was public information, th party, publicly available. Is... Uh, and so, yeah, we decided pretty much to retain everything. Uh, as it was. Uh. Bangladesh doesn't care if it's on Wikipedia. Huh? Bangladesh doesn't care if it's on Wikipedia. We want to be properly presented. <laughs> well, what do you what do you feel about the footnotes? Because there's there's like entire pages of footnotes, right? I love footnotes. I love well, footnotes. I mean, that's the kind of fiction uh, 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 that I really love. Have you read House of Leaves, for instance? That's full of footnotes. Uh, and I love digressions. Uh, I love the way he carries an academic tone into uh, this novel, uh, along with aspects of biography, speculative fiction, magic realism. I, I kind of object to the fact that we uh, kind of immediately slot this into magic realism. I think it does much more than that. Um, I mean, because like, like a lot of uh, editors, you know, they don't they don't want any footnotes at all. They're basically, like you have to put it in the story. But uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, maybe that's why we uh, got along, and we are running out of time, uh, so we should just. He thought it might come to have the like, <laughs> question and answer session.
Uh, hi, uh, this is Tosif. Um, so uh, the thing that I wanted to say, uh, after reading the book, I had a feeling that he was holding himself back while he was talking about politics at times. So uh, as the moderator first introduced, and he implied the same thing, I, I think that it would have been a very different book uh, had he not had that kind of pre political pressure going on in the back of his mind. Uh, the other thing is uh, when he when you asked about the magical realism, uh, the tradition of magical realism in Bangladesh, actually there are uh, uh, you know elements of magical realism in Homan Ahmed as she clearly pointed out, but the person who has consistently written in the magical realism tradition in Bangladesh is Professor Sayyid Munzurul Islam. And uh, the mermaid is, has, has been translated. So yes, I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Uh, I'm not saying that there was any foul play or conspiracy at hand. But my question is that do writers and artists who express themselves in these grand narratives, like novels, have reasons to fear for their lives because of their expression? Thank you. I mean, I don't think so, but I, I write science fiction, so probably nobody's, <laughs> nobody's trying to gun me no, down. No, I believe uh, that there was some, some sort of censorship uh, persecution involved uh, with uh, the black coat this this novel was it was it banned in bangladesh because it was available in india I think uh, to answer your question, um, in terms of this specific book, I don't think there's anything in the book that isn't political. It is about the country, and it is about the birth of the country, the way in which the country was formed was a bloody, monstrous, horrific act of violence, and that is how the country came about. That's, how, that's what our parents did. They went into war, and Babu's parents did the exact same thing. So if you take a look at whether or not violence is something or uh, authors should be afraid of violence, absolutely not, then they can't write. Um, if you're going to be writing about the country as a whole, you cannot ignore whitewash or pretend politics isn't literally how the country was born. So I don't think that that is something he even thought about. Um, because as, I, as um, Kanishk was pointing out, he did put in elements about the Rohingyas, about refugees, about the crisis on the, and that's um, regarding women and, and violence here. You see it in the book. So I, I believe, sir, you said, do we fear for our lives? writing what we write, or writers, not us specifically, am I right? Okay. In terms of like just normal fiction. Got it. And leaving I just wanted to make sure I, I had your question right. Well, you know, it's not that writers don't live in fear around the world in, in many places, in many spaces. Uh, they're jailed and they're censored, um, you know, the, depending on where they are, what the situation is. Um, I live in the US. Um, I am, you know, I, I'm, I'm an American citizen. Um, I can write a novel excoriating American history and excoriating um, uh, the, 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 the troubles that I see in society and politics. I can name names without slandering or, or libel, but I can, I can do that there without, uh, without fear that, oh, this, this won't get published, or if it does, you know, there will be, you know, the press will be uh, uh, put out of business by the government. No, because it's, we're protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution. Um, I, can do, I can do over there what I won't be able to do in many other places. Um, you know, I can speak directly to a political situation. I can speak directly to religious issues. Um, I can show characters that represent, you know, powerful figures. Uh, I can do all of that. So I, I have the privilege of being in that space. And I'm a huge critic of, of US politics and US foreign policy. Uh, but I also recognize that uh, there are protections there that I have. Well, while, while he's showing off about his American citizenship, I'd just like to, I'd just like to add. I'll marry him. That, uh, <laughs> we, we, we have an additional layer of security for Bangladeshi authors because we're writing in English and hardly anybody reads it. It's, it's, <laughs> We're really not under threat, you know. 
Here, here. I, I think that trumps his passport, really. I think, I think, I think we cannot take there. any more questions. Just one question to all the panelists. Will Babu Bangladesh uh, stand the test of time? Time is up. Obviously. I mean, that's why I'm here. Um, this is an incredible book and written by a person who I respected and liked. But this is also an incredible book and I'm speaking as an academic and as somebody who will be teaching this book at some point or the other. Yes, yes, absolutely. People will be reading it, enjoying it, studying it, I think, for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hopefully. Yes, and if it doesn't, then it's on us to make sure it does. On Kanishk. <laughs> Thank you so much. The last question before you went to the end was, was my son afraid of writing about politics? Well, sir, wherever you have freedom of, of the press, you'll have freedom of speech. So it's for you to judge what freedoms you have and you don't have in this country, okay? Thank you. Thank you.